we're in Melbourne with Harry Averley. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who we would qualify as a translator, but you've written also on translation studies or you've written about translation as well. Both. Both. And yeah. particularly translation in the Southeast Asia. Right. Region. That's the important thing. So what's your job at the moment, Harry? Basically, I'm honorary mm -hmm. professor okay. in translation and interpreting studies at Monash University. I've retired and I spend my days talking about translation, yeah. doing translation and making sure others are working in that area. Sounds so, like an ideal life. I don't have to go to meetings, I don't give any lectures. <laughs> Don't get paid, so I'm not sure how I deal with it. Ah, you don't get paid. Well, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. But you've been at Monash there for, for quite a while. I've been at Monash for about five, seven years. Okay. I started at Monash. Yeah. I finished up at Monash. Okay. In between, I've been lots of other places. Okay. As well, so. And you're specialising in what languages? You're translating from? Translating from Indonesian and Malay, which are the same language in a way, but separate because mm -hmm. of colonial influence and okay. trajectory of history. So I've done a lot from those languages. I've done some from Hindi, which I don't know, okay. but I've done collaborative translations right. with people who do know Hindi, and I'll explain it. Okay. So they give you a version in English and you yeah. clean it up? or. We work on a version All right, okay. together. Um, it basically comes out of my dropout days in the 1980s when I was following Rajneesh, Indian teacher. Mm -hmm. And I got interested in what he had to say, but I could never read what he had to say in Hindi. Mm -hmm. But more recently, last decade, I had a chance to work with people who knew Hindi. So I did collaborative translations. We picked our way through, word by word, line by line poetry from 18th century, devotional writers that we mm -hmm. talk about, mainly Muslim writers. And so I've got two languages which I really do know. Okay. I've got Hindi which I don't know but other people know. Okay. And I've got French, Francophone, Vietnamese writing. Okay. Which I sort of know a bit about. Okay. Okay, so it's all Southeast Asia, extended Southeast Asia. It's all Southeast Asia. For me that's that's the region. As an Australian, some of us have to deal with the region. That's where we live. It's where we live. Places, yeah. It's increasingly where we live. Have you been a pioneer in that field? I Do suppose so. Yeah. I suppose so. I started in the 70s. Yeah. Did a lot of translation. Dropped out in the 80s. Came back. Went to oh, Malaysia. Let's go back. Go, go back. Go, we're going to take this back to your mid-20s. Uh, where were you then? Had you dropped out by then? <laughs> no, I hadn't dropped out by yeah. then. I dropped in by then. Yeah. I mean, Mid-twenties, I was just starting teaching at Monash. So I taught there for about five years. And I went to Penang in 1972, and that was really crucial. I was there for about three years. But a lot of my translations that I've been doing before then began to appear. So, so you, you studied Malay? There. I studied Indonesian Malay at the University yeah. of Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Went to Monash in mid-60s yeah. to teach Indonesian literature. Mm -hmm. Then went to Malaysia for three years to basically get the experience of the culture in motion, in the culture. And I started translating because I thought it was important for the region. I also felt that there was a lot of no, I wouldn't say a lot, but there was certainly all the translation that existed was being subsidised by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, by the Americans. And I wanted to get a different voice mm -hmm. out of Southeast Asia, a more representative one. Mm -hmm. I thought less political, but I had some political aims in mind as well, because Pramudra Anantatur who subsequently became very famous. I did some early translations of his and that was the ground. And that was very political of me, so I couldn't escape. So this is opposing the regime at the time there? Or it, it, it was. Yeah. It was, and 
and mean, opposing American foreign relations policy as it well. It was in the extension. It was the sixties. Okay. Coming out of my net. Right. Okay. Other places, but I thought it was important to do it. I did Indonesian poetry. I did absurdist Indonesian plays. Some of which went back into Indonesian theatre mm-hmm. in other parts of Southeast Asia as well. So mid twenties, I was just getting started. By 30, 35, I was really into it. 1982, I was looking back over my papers. I dropped out. How old were you then? You laugh, obviously. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. I've been dean of the School of Humanities at Murdoch University. Right. I know. We were saying you were there. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was probably time to get out. Okay. For a while, but in a sense, I couldn't get out because no one else was doing what I was doing. And yeah, yeah. There was still a demand. So dropout means what? Where do you? Where does one go? To. Um, one doesn't have a full-time job, one okay. doesn't do part-time teaching. All right. But you keep translating? Well, I gave a paper in 82 saying, this is my last act as a translator, I'm finished. Okay. And I thought Indonesian literature had cut ground down to a bit of a halt with the Suharto okay. New Order, which was very repressive. Yeah. But 89, I got an invitation to go to Malaysia. So that's the other side of what I'm doing, Indonesia and Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Same language, different literature and different culture. And so I became involved back in Malay literature and Malay culture. And then I got a job at Latrobe and I stayed at Latrobe till 2008. And that kept me going, but it sent me to Vietnam, got me interested in the Francophone Vietnamese writings. Mm-hmm. So this legend's from Serene Lands. Okay. Is from Tezoi in Hanoi, translated from French. And as I say, I also did some translations from the Hindi of 18th okay. century devotional okay. poetry. So it's very personal, I think, okay. how translators live and move. I was interested looking back at a quotation of Helen Waddell. One doesn't say, I will be a poet, one doesn't say, I will be a translator, but somehow, it's almost a calling. One, okay. one responds to this. And yeah. One continues to respond, depending how one's life develops. And I'm interested in the, called, yeah. in the political motivation as well. I mean, it's not just an aesthetic thing. Uh, was it, is that, does that continue through? That your selection of texts are oppositional voices or voices not heard otherwise? It's not, it's not a dominant thing for me. I contemporary Indonesian poetry in 74. Follow up from that is Secrets Need Words, which is the whole Suharto era. Mm-hmm. And the political concern does return there because what I'm interested to show is how people responded to an, an essentially repressive regime, how they challenged by mm-hmm. indirect confrontation, by writing very absurdist. Okay. okay. Which life really doesn't have much meaning. Feminists, as well as a form of opposition, yeah. the feminists were very important in the late Suharto period, and I mean, as an opposition to 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 the regime at the time. You mean? I think so. Okay. Yeah. And so, a woman called Dorothea Rosa Hodiani is very strong feminist. Pretty opposed to Sahato, and she doesn't write poems to say, get rid of Sahato. Mm-hmm. But she says, this is how we are, and this is where we are mm-hmm. today. And I guess my translations of Rangra, the new version, one in 1972, mm-hmm. one in 19, um, 2007 or so, 2011, testimony. I mean, so it's, it continues. Mm-hmm. These are uh, voices against political regimes or, or the politics is there. You're also dealing with uh, majority Islamic cultures. Is, is that a factor as well? Or? It's a recent factor. And it's something that I've written about 
because it's something that coming from the outside first we don't realize and Indonesians, Malays themselves didn't place great deal of stress on Islam but today it's inescapable and I think anyone who translates literature, translates culture has to look at Islam and has to be aware of the nuances of what's going on. There's three strands in contemporary literature, one, one of which is very feminist, very sexy, very embarrassing. Sexy? Sexy. <laughs> okay. The way Indonesian literature has never been sexy uh. before. One is youth literature for women of an Islamic kind. And the big issue is, will I get married and will I wear the headscarf? Mm -hmm. And th these are the problems. Will I get married will I wear a headscarf? Okay. And there's more general literature, but about schools, about life, about situation. If you go to Indonesia, if you go to Malaysia, you just have to know this. It's how the culture works. And okay. You don't have to be Muslim. It helps. Okay. Sometimes because people are much more accepting. Where do you publish? You publish, I publish in Southeast Asia. Okay. I don't, I don't publish in Europe. Rose's book has been published in England by Harp. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I publish exclusively in Southeast Asia. And why Asia. is that? Because that's where the publishers are. That's where the markets are. One of the things about index translation, if you look up Indonesia, Malaysia, who's translating them or where, they're translating themselves yeah. for yeah. distribution. Yeah. And so I thought I was translating for London and New York right. and Sydney and Canberra. And I was really, in a sense, being distributed in Southeast Asia. So the readers are other cultures in Southeast Asia? Okay. They are the same. In Malaysia, people are reading Malay literature. Some of the people are Malay and they're checking around to yeah. see if you've done the right thing. Okay. And the others are Chinese and Indian. Okay. Malay is not right. Enough. Right. And so they want to know what's going on. And the other group of people who are reading are the rest of Southeast Asia. Okay. So Singapore, Philippines. But yeah. people who are reading English are not reading regional languages. So English is, is a is a lingua franca in the region. Absolutely, that says. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. What about the, you, you said Malay people? And uh, uh, Sake talks about Japan, Japanese people reading their works in English translation. Yeah. Uh, and and, and are really interested in it. Is that this? Like, the, the, is it a checking function, or are they actually? I think it's this a translation function. Yeah, okay. People are interested to know how you're perceiving and how you're understanding yeah, yeah. their literature. Um, but it's also a way of seeing themselves in, it, in another language. Which is a, yeah. Which is a rather strange function for us to think about. Cause it is a strange function, and Bert and Raphael, translating critics, says, mm. you're not translating for those guys. They can read it. You're translating for people who don't know who can't read in the original. Yeah. But in the Southeast Asian region, what, what the implication of this to me is that you can assume the culture is known and you can assume the objects are known. So if a durian, obnoxious fruit, delicious taste, comes up, you don't need big footnotes about durian. Mm -hmm. If a particular type of food comes up, dosa, People know these things. And so it's a different mindset for the translator that you're not translating out from one culture to another, but in fact you're translating for a region that understands these things. It took, it took me a long time to learn that. Yeah. No, I think it's a function we don't think about. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, we're a white Anglo-Saxon male. Right. From a wealthy yeah. country, is, is it the danger of, if 
an unconscious imperialistic relationship and the what right do we have to go in there and mediate between these cultures in our imperial language? Is it? It's a question I worry about. It's a question I've learned to ignore. Good. Because yeah. I couldn't translate women. Women of any culture. Why not? Because I'm a man. Oh, oh right, of course. Do you know you, that? Yeah. you follow the logic. Yeah. yeah I yeah. couldn't translate anyone who's dead. Because you're alive, yes. <laughs> okay. I suppose they're alive when they're ready. But, but, yeah, yeah. You know. Um, what I decided was that it's important for me to understand where these writers are coming from, what their understanding of the world is, what they're doing with their literature, and what's important to them. And I am all those things you just said, white, Anglo-Saxon, male, Catholic. But Catholic? <laughs> liberal Catholic. All right. Which is a aunt's brain another day. Um, oh, you went to Ang Anglican, you did Anglican theology somewhere there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's part of my job. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I did. Um, yeah. But what I can do is present a different perspective, yeah. therefore. And so I think being an outsider, who is simultaneously an insider, puts you as being responsible for explaining to people outside what's going on inside, mm -hmm. and gives you the opportunity of explaining to people inside how you see what's going on inside in a way that can create dialogue. Because you are seeing what they're seeing, but you're not seeing exactly what they're seeing, you're seeing how you see what they see. Do you think in that kind of situation, people, readers, are aware that this translation is a version of the text, Absolutely. rather than the text? Oh, yeah. Very yeah? Good. Okay, so the, yeah. you're in a dialogic space yeah. from the outset. And Whereas in other places, you know, you, the translation replaces the original. Yeah. The original translation of the <laughs> translation. You couldn't have that cut out. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, th I think because people are seeing the original as existing in the first place and they see your translation mm -hmm. alongside it, so it's not replacing it. Okay, so you just know. visually it's, it's, it, it exists there. Yeah. As you, okay, you just started translating for whatever reason. Um, for political reasons. For political reasons, which is a very noble motivation. And for aesthetic reasons, too. Is, um, has, has any translation theory or translation studies ever been of help to you? I think, as a translator, as a scholar, um, probably, I have to say that I came across translation studies formally only at the beginning of the 2000s. And mm -hmm. I actually did a Master of Applied Linguistics mm -hmm. in translation studies to work out what I was doing, mm -hmm. what it was all about. And it gave me many insights into the process of why people want to publish certain works in certain countries and are not interested in other works. Mm -hmm. Some works that are great. We love this in Indonesia, it's so poetic can't translate the poetry. Or it's so emotionally upfront. But in English we don't like emotionally upfront. In Malay I translated a novel for which I'm accursed to this day, which is very repetitive, so I took out all the repetition. Mm. Five hundred pages down to two hundred and fifty. Right, that's <laughs> it's very bad, and I wouldn't okay. do it again. Yeah. But everyone knows that thing I translated. Yeah. And some of the Poly system about meeting the norms mm -hmm. of the receiving culture. Mm -hmm. No one in English is going to read 500 pages of repetitious yeah. prose. Yeah. And so I understand that. Okay. You've written on Scopos theory as well. Yeah. So you obviously find something in there that, but is it is justifying a practice that existed previously? Is Explaining it? the practice. Sorry? Explaining it. Explaining it, yes. Yeah. Yes. I tell my students that theory is important to know, it makes you professional, it helps you to understand what you're doing, what other people are doing, what it's about. The 
practice you do it, and you do it well or you do it badly, but reflecting on it is always an important human okay. trait. Okay. And, um, I do scholarly work as well, so that's the other side where the translation theory yeah. becomes important after 2000, after doing the course. And I focus on Southeast Asian writing, Southeast Asian translators. I think it's important to realise that a lot of this is done in English, so there's a whole lot of post-colonial theory. For the French, we're starting to get French post-colonial mm -hmm. theory okay. coming up now. Um, some of my Malay writers read English, don't read British. They read American literature, or they read literatures translated mm. into English. So, so the whole Spanish magic realism yep. is an important influence, not through Spanish, through English. Mm. And the British are totally irrelevant. <laughs> To this, but, yeah. for um, beginning research students, what what kind of research do you think should be done on translation? What are some topics you'd like to see people working on? I think we need to look at translation in Australia. I don't think we've begun to look at what's been done and how that's changed over yeah. two hundred and fifty years and more yeah. Yeah. of settlement. That's, it's interesting, isn't it? That we it's an idea, a history of translation in Australia. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Why, why, haven't it, why hasn't it been done? Southeast yeah. Asian is yeah. important to look at, and particularly people who have Southeast Asian languages, yeah. we need to encourage these guys into the history of translation in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Small studies of individuals. I've just done one of friend of mine, Mohammed Haji Saleh, who's a very famous translator and writer and academic in Malaysia. And there are two or three other Malaysian translators who have been discussed, particularly by a woman called Haslin Arun, but we need studies of Southeast Asia, who translates, what they translate, and we need to lead studies of how translations circulate in Southeast Asia. I think we have this Post-colonialism gives us the idea that the centre of the universe is in London or Paris mm. and everything else is peripheral. But in Indonesia, Jakarta is centre mm. and the regions are peripheral and Kuala Lumpur is central and regions are peripheral and the Arab world is central and mm. Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur is peripheral. But it gives us an opportunity to take traditional understandings from Southeast Asian society and culture and work them through translation theory, renewing translation theory with these different perspectives and multiple centres, multiple uses of English, multiple ways of receiving a literature in another culture. So my Malay, I went to the Philippines and someone said, you are our gateway to Malay literature. Very nice, but I didn't know any had been published. Oh no, we photocopied the whole lot. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Harry, thank you very much.